Precision medicine, is it hype or help, fact or fiction? Welcome to Precision Insight. This is a podcast series where the most influential thought leaders and innovators in healthcare sit with me to chat about the latest technologies and tools of precision medicine. What do we have available today as patients, caregivers and healthcare providers? Are we seeing a difference in the healthcare system? What is coming up in the near future? If you want to know more about this incredibly fast moving field of research and development, stay tuned. So hello everyone, I'm your host, Martin. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Genexus Healthcare Systems, and we're really excited to welcome our guest for today's episode, James Liu. Dr. Liu co-founded population genomics company Helix in 2015, where he leads the research, regulatory, policy, and bioinformatics teams. He oversees the teams that develop and validate the science and technology behind Helix's solution, including Helix's ClearCat Next Generation Sequencing Lab. Dr. Liu also works with Helix's partners to design and execute population scale genomic research initiatives. Prior to Helix, Dr. Liu was a faculty member at Duke University, where he focused on translational genomics and developed machine learning methodologies for electronic medical records. Before we jump in, really like to start with maybe a little lighter question if you had to explain to a seven-year-old what pharmacogenetics is how would you describe it maybe actually just first off martin obviously thank you for having me here it's obviously been a pleasure to work together and i applaud your work on this podcast and the ability to kind of help educate the broader public about what we're trying to do in precision medicine well regarding first uh, kind of your question on pharmacogenetics what I would think about is DNA component, and then kind of what we think about is, is drug interaction. As you know, everyone is born with their DNA sequence, it's inherited from their mother and father, and there are components of that DNA that what we call kind of variation. And that variation is what makes you different, me and you different, and different from everyone else in the world, and that's kind of part of the splendor of, I think, of, of humankind. Part of those variations impact our ability to metabolize different compounds. That means that our body processes these chemicals in sometimes faster ways or sometimes slower ways. And those chemicals can also be thought of as things like drugs. The field of pharmacogenetics is really about the differences in how people metabolize or process drugs and therapeutics and how we can better tailor people's treatment regimes to make sure that they get the right doses and the right drugs at the right time and make sure they can have kind of healthier lives and better treatment. So it sounds really complex. I mean, is it difficult to analyze someone's DNA for pharmacogenetics? It's a good question. The field has come a long ways in the last 10 years. And if you think about even 10 years ago, at the time, you know, personally for me, I was working at, I think at the time we were sequencing maybe the first five people in the world. So back in, I think, 2010, the largest programs in the world were trying to talk about the first five and the first hundred and the first thousand people. And really starting to map the variation across humankind from a genetics perspective, but also really around technology development. And so from there to here today, we've made long strides in both our ability to generate the data, but also to analyze that data for a multitude of uses, including particularly for pharmacogenetics. I think what has historically been a very, very challenging technical problem has become more and more routine as we've gotten better at understanding the genome, but also at processing those data. So now I think it's becoming relatively routine or can be routine for us to think about generating pharmacogenetic profiles and understanding of people's ability to metabolize various drugs at scale for essentially for everyone. So I think we're entering kind of a new era where the availability of this data won't be hindered by our ability to generate it, but really will be driven by our ability to make sure that we get the right clinical value as well as economic value from that data. I mean, I think that those last two points building on your response that the technology of testing is now becoming i wouldn't say routine but easier but now it is the translation of that genetic information into clinical utility i think it would help our listeners if you told us why you started helix what was the light bulb moment or moments and can you tell us a little bit about helix main goals sure i'm happy to so maybe just a bit about the genesis of Helix and maybe our central thesis would be helpful. Back even about a decade ago, we started thinking about the idea that maybe in healthcare, there's probably only one data set that actually does not change. 
So if you think about your routine experience with your physician or your healthcare system, you might have imaging, you might have laboratory tests, and all of those things actually have a, what I would consider a dynamic aspect or a time-based aspect. So it can change from point to point. But your genome, what you inherit, doesn't. It's actually probably the only thing in medicine that doesn't change. And so our belief has always been that if you can generate that data at high enough quality and store it and really attach it to a person so they can use it everywhere in healthcare, suddenly the ability to use genetics will transform. It will become instant. It will become an instant digital query. So the data has become immediately available. And because it becomes a digital companion to the patient, it can be used almost anywhere in healthcare, no matter the patient context. That was a lot of our central thesis of building Helix was let's make the data ubiquitous and available and make it truly kind of a digital service that you can imagine using in every single context where you might have an interaction with the physician or the healthcare system. So that was the genesis of the company. We continue to march along that. And much of our programs today on the population genetics side with major U.S. health systems is around this idea that let's generate the data on a large basis for your patient population and then figure out how to leverage it over and over again throughout the patient's care to give them better care, better treatments, and better diagnoses. So it's about finding those right opportunities where the data really provides leverage for diagnosis, treatment, or prognosis. That's a really radical approach. It sounds very different from a lot of other groups that have talked about lab testing in healthcare. And there's this idea that you've got this one fixed thing that doesn't change that you can utilize in many different healthcare situations is completely novel. Do you think that that is one of the major differences between Helix's approach to genetic testing and other genetic testing organizations? Yeah, I think we, you know, maybe by design or not, we're probably as an organization thinking not only about the data generation component, which I think is a core component of what the typical clinical labs will think about. And so Helix runs what is now one of the largest clinical sequencing centers in the United States. But we have a very large technology team really focused on the ability to re-leverage these data over and over again. We loosely kind of have an internal metric, which is really focused on the idea of how many uses of the genome. And if we can drive that number up, we've actually just increased value, not only for the patient, but also for the healthcare system. And so really our goal is not number of sequences, but number of uses per sequence. And as we think about that driving that forward, it's about how do we think about it from pharmacogenetics, given the patient's situation. Today, they may be a cardiology patient, but tomorrow they may be a mental health patient. And so those uses will be different. And so how do we make sure that we are not thinking about data generation, but really about usage in the appropriate clinical context? That's fascinating, using that as that metric. And I can see that actually in rule outs, you may have a lot more than rule ins. And by that, I mean, you're using the genetics to say this drug is safe or this disease is very unlikely, and therefore we can move on to other things. That sort of impression, correct? That's right. I think digitization does a couple of things. One is those type of questions were historically, like you may never have run a genetics rule out test because it's too expensive. Or you might have decided that by the time I get a result, which might be weeks later, I would have already done something, so it, you know, it doesn't matter. Digitization does a couple things. One is, obviously, digital queries are much cheaper than chemistry. And so there's a cost component of it where suddenly you can think about dramatic drops in the cost of a genetic answer. But the second component is, because it is digital, like the ability to integrate into a workflow and then get an answer instantly is also very different. So that we think about it really about how do you kind of bring those aspects of what we would consider normal in our you know, day-to-day consumer life, on-demand, instant answers, are really kind of a companion, and how do you kind of give those advantages to the healthcare system? It drives a lot of our thinking. Yeah, and that's a clear vision. Where do you think you are, or where is, let's broaden it, what is the current state of genetics use in patient-centered care right now, say, across North America? So it's a great question, and. I'll get into more detail, but I have a, some of a try answer, which is it's going a little bit slower than we think it should, but it'll likely go faster than we believe it will. So what, where we are, I think, is we're in the early parts of the adoption curve, and there are very clear pointy specialty applications where genetics is clearly superior to whatever else is being done. And those tend to be fairly narrow patient populations, 
where they may have either had what we call a diagnostic odyssey, which is they might have had a long set of treatments or workups where genetics suddenly shortcuts that process and gives people answers instantly. It might be in specific diagnostic cases in cancer or in cardiology. But I think on a population level basis, we're in the, I would call the first ending of generating the evidence that population level screening is going to be useful and valuable for everyone. And you know, we've been generating some of that core evidence with our healthcare systems. And I think we're in the early part of that wave where we're seeing you know, our programs are starting to be a couple hundred thousand people per health system, which ends up being about 10 to 50 percent of a health system. And I think as we think about the number of health systems now engaging in those programs in the United States, three years ago, it was like one or two. Yeah. You know, this year or last year, I think there were probably five health systems engaging in large scale programs. And kind of in the what we anticipate in the next five years is I think there will be a vast migration of healthcare systems believing that precision medicine at this scale will become standard of care. And so we're starting to see that migration. Certainly the national programs like we see in the UK have already made that distinction. They've already decided that to some extent population level sequencing is going to be a normal part of routine care. So they've already started making some of those investments. So I think we're seeing that migration. I think as we go, the evidence generation is going to frankly accelerate as well. We're relatively optimistic that we're in the early part of what is going to be a, an, an inevitable curve. Yes, and I think that that's shared with a lot of companies in this space for obvious reasons. So to bring that curve a little bit closer or to ensure that we see that adoption, what are the critical elements to achieving success in large-scale genomic initiatives? Yeah, it's a great question. Maybe I can kind of break it up to a couple of components. Part of that is, I think, centric to Helix, which is our view that it's really kind of a sequence once, query often. So you generate the data once and use it over and over again. So the first component, which I think we've largely solved this point, is making sure you can generate high enough quality data that it can stand the test of time. So we've been focused on that effort. A lot of our initial technical work was making sure the sequencing quality would stand up over time. And I think we've largely achieved that at this point. The second component of it really is how do you kind of architect the information systems that genetics can become kind of a central data layer that's part of the normal operating system of healthcare. And so we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years also architecting the technical solutions to say, if I want to deliver an answer to this point in a clinic, can we do that? So I would say that's the second kind of building block. The third and fourth building blocks are where I think we are today, which is how do we think about clinical evidence generation and making sure that the clinical community understands the value that genetics can bring in the vast amount of different spaces. I think, Martin, you guys have done some pretty interesting work here around pharmacogenetics and mental health, as well as a few other patient populations, if, if I'm not mistaken. I, I think I saw that report or some of the, yeah, some of the news you. about that. I'd yeah. love to hear more about that. Those types of studies are obviously going to be key in terms of driving clear benefits for patients. Mm -hmm. And then obviously just making sure the economics work. I think that's the fourth layer is yeah. obviously these systems have to invest up front often for data generation and for usage. And then how do you think about making sure they continue to drive value for patients from an economics perspective? So I think we're really yeah. on steps three and four now. I would love to hear if you don't mind sharing some of your work on the, the more recent study. I certainly can. I think I might save that for another podcast, but maybe you can interview me and, and we can do that. But cer cer certainly we're one of many organizations that are exploring and producing the evidence for pharmacogenetics for various conditions, definitely. But I would actually like to go back. I thought that the way you dealt with that, with the four areas, is really helpful to listeners who perhaps don't have that much knowledge of genomics generally, but you mentioned something at the beginning, which I think a lot of people are not necessarily aware of, which is sequencing quality. I mean, I know people are not necessarily aware of what sequencing even means. The assumption I think for many people is you get the DNA and it's there and it's black and white and there's no nuance of grayness in genetic information. But what you're talking about is sequencing quality. Maybe you could just unpack that a little bit and say, what you mean by sequencing quality and perhaps how you address that. So let me just dive into it in a couple of ways. I think we think about sequencing quality in terms of maybe there's two components of it. One is kind of really around core accuracy, which is if I see something and I can interpret it, is it really there? So how do you achieve most accurate tests that I can possibly achieve? The second component is what I would call something called completeness which is the genome is being mapped at increasingly higher and higher resolutions. 
And the completeness is, are you being able to capture all the different components and complexity of the genome? And we've made major strides, both in accuracy as well as completeness, and to make sure you can kind of get to the highest kind of quality you can in both components of it. I would say to some extent, it continues to be a little bit of a moving target. If technology continues to get better, you will be able to achieve more accuracy and more completeness. So it's a part of our continued investment and continued improvement. But from where we are today, based on technology, we can achieve in the very, very high percentage, 99.9, et cetera, percentage of accuracy at this point. And then completeness, the compendium of what we know in the clinical space, we captured vastly, you know, the vast majority of it already. So it's just making sure you continue to kind of deliver about those two axes and then making sure you have a continued commitment to keep up with it. And this accuracy, that is all software, isn't it? I mean, I, I seem to remember going to the Sanger Institute in Cambridge and their main problem was getting rid of the heat from the computers with, that were doing the sequencing. Yeah. Is that <laughs> impression true that this is really a computing issue more than a, the actual sequence, the primers or whatever it is? It's an interesting question because different questions in the genome have different solutions, but we tend to think of them both as chemistry and software. Mm -hmm. And I would say increasingly a large component of the questions can be solved with good software and good algorithms. But there are certainly some things in genomics that you just need unique chemistry for, and then you have to couple them with software. So at least at Helix internally, we believe that tight coupling is essential and it allows us to do things that you historically could only do with better chemistry or with better software, if you put them together, you really can achieve some pretty powerful things. Yeah, I think that is very useful for people listening to hear that this is a bringing together of, and not, they're not siloed, but industries that not necessarily seem partnered together of chemistry and software. It's definitely new. So I'm just gonna switch a little bit. Sure. Um, we can't really talk at this time without mentioning COVID and we continue to see the impact of COVID on healthcare. In terms of healthcare systems, how have you seen COVID-19 changing delivery of care? And do you think some of those changes will last beyond the pandemic? I think in the clinical and the research space, COVID-19 is the whale in the room. It's where most of us have been spending a lot of the time in the last couple of months. And my guess is it's largely a big wake-up call not only for the healthcare systems, but also for the governments who have been thinking about investments in public health. And I think generally, at least in the U.S., there is a tendency to fund more towards what we consider care for the disease versus primary prevention and actions that would just prevent disease or prevent adverse outcomes from even occurring in the first place. And so hopefully what we'll see wholesale is more a move towards what we consider like almost public health, precision public health as well about thinking about interventions on a population scale that really drive uh, changes in the healthcare system versus waiting until someone is extremely ill and just treating them. And so I think overall, my hope is that we'll start to see, and we will see more of those kind of interventions, because I think certainly in the U.S. it has been underinvested in for some period of time. Yeah. On the core healthcare system side, there's, I also do think it's been, uh, what we're seeing actually is an acceleration in technology that historically that we knew had good productivity gains, but kind of not within the core of traditional healthcare. So things like telemedicine, digital tools, the ability to get remote diagnoses, the ability to leverage new technologies for risk stratification. I think what you've seen historically has been like health systems in the U.S. say like, look, we, we're really good at running elective procedures. We're going to continue doing that. We want patients to come in and we want to see them face to face. And what COVID's forced them to say is we need to transition more wholesale, our entire infrastructure to more towards digital and remote. Hmm. And I think those investments will much outlast COVID because once you've learned to get a Zoom call with your physician or have a consult remotely, it's hard to imagine, like, especially if I'm in a rural community, I'm going to drive an hour to do the same thing again. Yeah. And if you've already built the infrastructure and the muscles, like, why not continue to invest? And so my guess is you'll see a wholesale continued investment in digital um, and digital experience at the health system level. And we're going to get much better at treating and diagnosing patients on a remote basis than we could historically. I think that's not good for the system. I think it does make the systems more efficient. And there'll be investments in things like pharmacogenetics and other genomics that help us better understand patients and make sure they get the right treatment without them having to come in for adverse outcomes and things like that. So I mean, that, that's helpful to hear that. And I think that in terms of the digital platforms that are being developed and you talked about telemedicine but this digital approach do you think that's actually going to be helpful for the adoption of 
let's say, genomics broadly, not just focusing on pharmacogenetics. I do. And I think part of it is that the distribution of expertise for many of these new technologies, so that both the talent and the knowledge is not evenly distributed across where patient populations have to be. So there might be centers of excellence in Vancouver or in the Bay Area or in Boston, but the vast majority of care, at least in the U.S., is not occurring in those places, right? Mm. Um, they're occurring in the heartland of America, in the community hospital settings. And so the ability to drive kind of what I would consider like best in class digital consulting tools, whether that's in person or, or even algorithm based, is going to be essential for the adoption. And really to, I would say, increase access to what I would consider as cutting edge care in places historically that have been short staffed or unable to kind of access those types of opportunities. So I do think the ability to disseminate those things using digital tools is going to be key and making sure that we can kind of wrap those right tools and the right digital workflows for physicians and those communities to be successful, I think is going to be a a big part of the transition here. Yeah. And in terms of assuming that 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 is the picture going forward, others have talked about the interprofessional explosion, the potential of having many different professionals, including pharmacists, nurse practitioners, and others involved in care. Do you see them employing genomics, maybe just pharmacogenetics, but maybe other genomic tests in their practice? And if so, how do they do that? Yeah, I do think, I think we almost have no choice but to bring along our, you know, our advanced practitioner colleagues in this journey. You can't possibly have a a specialist on every single primary care console for pharmacogenetics. It's not going to happen. I think the question is, how do you equip our advanced practitioners, our nurse practitioners, our physician assistants, our primary care physicians to act appropriately, have the right knowledge, and to be aware of where the edges are, right? Where things can be are, are appropriate or not. And a lot of that is around digital tools that not only provide education opportunities and continue medical education, I think is a key component of this, but it's also around making sure you have di- almost these digital guardrails. So you know what is kind of within the practice boundaries and those that which you know need more specialist referral. You guys have done a really nice job of building these clinical decision support tools to really support some of these activities so that you know almost anyone can do them within certain fields. And so I think that's a key component of what we're trying to do here. And those types of tools are inevitable. The growth and the requirements for medical knowledge are only increasing and probably increasing exponentially at this point. So it's impossible to keep up with everything. And so you really need these digital crutches to really perform at the cutting edge of medicine and provide the best care. And so I think that's the, the future we're moving towards. And I think, you know, largely, I think the field is aligned with that. Pleased you say that. And just coming towards the end, in an article for the HuffPost, you wrote, today's cutting edge, tomorrow's everyday experience. In which areas do you see the use of pharmacogenomics as an everyday experience, if not as the standard of care? You know, I actually don't believe we're that far away from a world where we're thinking about universal pharmacogenetics for certain patient populations. Certainly, I think there's great evidence in cardiology, mental health. I think we're seeing some in pain as well. And then certainly in some parts of oncology, pharmacogenetics is certainly, in many cases, actually can be life-saving. And so I think the question is, in those workflows and those places, is it better to invest up front so that you can get an answer instantly at the time at which a patient presents? Or, you know, is it okay to wait for two or four weeks to get the answer? And I think increasingly what we'll find is that for certain populations, certainly I think as we think about the more el- elderly patients or certain disease populations, where we have an expectation that they're going to end up having one, two, three, four, five pharmacogenetic mm-hmm. questions over their lifetime. I think it's going to be worth our while to generate those data up front to make sure that it's easy to incorporate and it can transform decision making instantly. So in the U.S., I often think about Medicare, which is, you know, a population that we understand over time that's increasingly going to be on more and more therapeutics over their lifetime, where there are going to be multiple interactions with drug and treatment. And we're having data at the tips of the provider's hands will be incredibly powerful for them. So it's really about driving, I think, those economic analyses in those broad populations to show that you can amortize the cost across the population. I view it almost like insurance to some extent, like everyone needs health insurance, right? And it helps us spread the cost of an individual's issue across the population, right? 
And I think very much like pharmacogenetics, I think you will be thinking about it in terms of, well, we should probably be judging around everyone because in the 20 or 30% of people in the next five to 10 years who will need it, it'll be incredibly valuable for them to have it at the point of use. We, with the governments, the health authorities are all discussing who should have tests. And I think you've ended up on that, you know, where do we start? Because even if I had an infinite amount of money, we know that we couldn't do the whole of the Canadian population tomorrow or the whole of the US population next month. We just don't have the technological resources. So then it is, who do we start with first? And that discussion is ongoing as people talk about returns on investment, who are the higher risk populations, and how do we as a health authority or an HMO identify those groups of patients. So, James, this has been a fascinating conversation. I thought your comment about the splendor of humankind reflecting our unique DNA was a lovely opening statement. And so, wrapping up with, okay, we've got to be strategic about this approach, but we've got to look at quality as we work through and the translation as well. So your insights have been really helpful and thank you very much for your time. Yeah, of course. And anytime, Martin, and thank you for having me. Thanks, James.